Hello, listeners. We're doing something a little bit different today. G'day, listeners. Before we uh, press play on the main episode, uh, we thought we should drop in with a quick little heads up about the content in today's podcast. Mm. Um, I probably didn't expect it to be quite so um, heavy, mm. and yet I probably should have based on the the content. So uh, we have just come right out, a mum um, sharing the story of losing her 18-year-old boy to um, some tragic circumstances. Um, that she does talk about in the interview. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all within context and it's it's a very important episode and we do hope that you um, do listen to it because mm-hmm. um, it's an incredibly important message in there about safety and all sorts of stuff that, that you'll hear. But we just wanted to let you know, um, uh, and I know it affected Coxie and I quite a lot uh, when we recorded this interview. Um, so uh, Coxie rightly suggested that we give you a quick heads up before you get into the main episode and go, holy crap, um, wasn't expecting that. Thanks for the warning, guys. (laughs) Yeah, I think if you um, typically listen to us with kids in the car or something similar, I don't believe this is an episode for kids to be listening to, particularly not young ones. It is very raw, and I think it's important that, that, that this story is told the way it's told. It is raw. It does make you stop and think in a way I certainly haven't experienced before. So I do encourage you to please make some time to listen to this episode. Um, just be mindful of little ears and maybe some of the rea- some of the reactions you could potentially have yourself. So uh, I wouldn't be listening to it on site with all the fellas either. No, maybe get the guests to come out and talk to your fellas on site instead. That's a damn fine idea. <laughs> Anyway, enjoy the episode. It's a it's a potentially heavy one, but it's very very important, um, and we hope that you take something out of this just as we did. Mm-hmm. Right, oh listeners, here we are. Now we're making an exception today, Coxie. Yeah, we, we are not telling a joke, although we are smiling. For those of you watching us on the YouTube channel, for those of you who don't know that we have a YouTube channel that listen to the podcast, you can also watch us on YouTube. So you can go down mindless rabbit holes after you've seen our video and have (laughs) YouTube tell you to watch some, you know, a rhinoceros eating sugar cane whilst driving on a bus Uh, because that seems to be the weird stuff that gets served up by the algorithm. Now, the reason we don't have a joke, Coxie, is because I guess in some respects today's episode is very serious and we Mm. want to get straight into chatting with our guest. Um, I know you're busting to introduce... Our guest today, <laughs> after our conversation with her off air uh, about our different, uh, um, well, am I allowed to say ethnic backgrounds? Is that? Yes, like, of course you can. Why not? Is 2023, I just, I don't know. No. I don't know what we I'm are, allowed to we say. Are, we do have an ethnic background, so <laughs> really, you can't, you can't change that. No. I know, I know. Absolutely true. So, Patricia, welcome to the show. Welcome to Tradies and Business. Great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, we are just going to let you introduce yourself so our listeners know who they're listening to and why they really should tune in for the next 45 minutes or so, or however long we manage to, to keep Coxie in one piece. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so tell us a bit about, about who you are and how you came to be talking to us today. Um, my name's Patricia Cassanidi, and um, I'm an international keynote speaker and safety advocate. And this title has only come after my 18-year-old passed away tragically on a, um, a job site about four years ago, in a, 1st of April 2019. And uh, he was tragically crushed by a scaffold that collapsed in Macquarie Park. And since that day, my whole life has turned around. Um, I used to be a coffee maker, so I used to have my own coffee van and uh, was actually working on that site where he passed away as well. Oh, no. So, But luckily I wasn't there that day. Um, I'd actually taken the day off that day um, because Christopher had just celebrated his 18th birthday. And we um, we were, I was cleaning up, so I thought, you know, you can go on your own today because he'd just bought himself a brand-new car, well, a Hilux, his first car for his birthday. And so Saturday I had all these people over and um, the Monday I decided to stay home and he went to work and never came home. 
I, I, I don't have the right words. I don't think, um, <clears throat> and listeners will know that I have a 19 year old apprentice carpenter and oh, what, who is one of five children. And I can't even begin to imagine, uh, the pain of what you have been through and, I even struggle to understand how you take that pain and turn it into such a positive um, message that you now have that has the opportunity to prevent this from happening for other people. That That's such an incredible journey that you've been on. Yeah, I just find um, if I if I don't do what I do, I'm actually worse. Mm. Um, Christopher was such a giving person. He was kind-hearted and... I couldn't think of anything, you know, better to do to be able to make sure that his death was not in vain. Mm. That is my my biggest thing and why I do what I do because if I can save a life in his honour, then I'm happy. I've done something for him and that, you know, he'll always be remembered in the name of safety. Mm, I, I do really find that very inspirational. I'm trying very hard to keep this together. I'm sorry. Um, I, do, I have a 20-year-old um, who's... A uh, apprentice carpenter as well. Mm. Every day that he goes um, goes out on the field, I worry about him, you know, and he doesn't realise how how much anxiety I get. And yeah. if he doesn't answer his phone, I'm like, where is he? You know, I'm 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 sending the search party out. To, of course, it's understandably, just horrible. Patricia, Patricia, tell us about Christopher. Sorry, Warwick. Yeah. Tell us about Christopher. Um, So Christopher, as I said before, was a kind-hearted, beautiful, beautiful kid, Um, one of those kids that every mum wishes for. Mm. Uh, Never needed to be told what to do, um, you know, when it came to chores and stuff. He, you know, even on a Sunday after working a long week, hard work, he'd still get up in the morning, mow the grass, you know, wash the cars without being told to do it you know what I mean you were always struggling with these kids screaming at them can you please go outside and (laughs) cut the grass or do something Christopher was just self you know self-motivated always you know was always drawn a lot of people were drawn to him um that were sort of like you know needed help or anything like that he he was like a little he was like an angel on earth Mm. he really was Mm. what a dreadful loss Perhaps appropriate uh, given the work that you're now doing and, you know, mm-hmm. as you say, I mean, time is is always cruel when it's shorter than we anticipate. Um, and as a parent myself, I, I can't imagine what losing a child would be like at that age. Um, yeah. So it I is guess- the worst thing that can happen in anyone's life. I believe there, that. there is nothing that compares to a loss of a child. Mm. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. Um, nothing could possibly go in my life that is worse than that. No, mm. I agree. Mm. Can you tell us about the circumstances surrounding what led to Christopher's death? Sure. So what actually happened, and mind you, it's taken a long time for me to figure out and find out exactly what happened because obviously the prosecution and the court cases were in, you know, with safe work and the builder and also the scaffolding company. So we did not find out until last year, November. Wow. Not exactly what happened. So that's more than three and a half years on um, of because I kept they kept saying I'm not privileged to know this information because it's uh, it. they had to keep it quiet yep. until the case. So all the investigations that were happened, so um, the, first, the first court case happened about two and a half years after it actually happened and I only know, knew a little bit but also from people talking of what had actually mm. happened, I knew from that. Mm. But what really happened is um, Synergy, who's the scaffolding company, was contracted to Janellen, the builder, mm-hmm. to supply a heavy-duty scaffold that also included two-ton loading platforms uh, because the builder wanted to preload bricks onto the scaffold. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that was not done 
as per the contract, and the scaffolding company only provided a normal heavy-duty scaffold. Oh. Um, at the handover, nobody questioned it. No, it wasn't communicated. So the builder obviously assumed that it was what he was supposed to have, oh. um, and they went ahead and loaded two tons of um, bricks onto the scaffold. Uh, so, and that was uh, it was actually overloaded by eighteen and a half tons. Oh my word! On on the scaffold, uh, but that was not a, the only problem. We knew right from the beginning that it was overloaded, um, and we also found out that there was no ties whatsoever. Oh no! Uh, so no ties were, and this is a nine-story scaffold, two bays wide. Um, all the ties had been removed and then overloaded by 18 and a half tons. That's as wow. far as I knew till last year. But then I also found out that there was transoms missing, missing and also there was no vertical bracing either on the scaffold. Mm. So everything you can possibly think of that could go wrong. Yeah. Wrong. Yep. The hardest part is that in the last four years, all I've been doing is speaking to workers about speaking up. Yeah, mm. and saying no to unsafe work practices. Um, the actual scaffolders that put this, the scaffold together did speak up and they said, look, we really need to stop the job. It seems like as though there's too much load on this and we need to get everyone off. But unfortunately the leading hand had that she'll be right moment and said, no, nah, it's fine. In um, a couple of hours it came down and crushed uh, my son to death and horrifically injured Khaled, who was his supervisor. Um, Christopher survived for 20 minutes under the, the rubble and um, he fell face down and copped the full brunt of it and then suffocated 20 minutes later. Oh. And Khaled, who was with him, his supervisor, he fell sitting down and the only reason why he was they managed to get to him was that he had a bar across his chest that was suffocating him. They cut that and mm. got him out. But, you know, the worst part of everything is that he, I speak to Carla all the time, and he says to me, Trish, the worst thing in my life is your, your son screaming your name. Oh. There was nothing I could do. And he goes, and that stays in my head. Um, all I hear him is just calling out for you. I tried to hold his hand and I couldn't even pull him towards me. I couldn't do anything. Uh, there's uh, nothing. And, you know, not only has he got that mental, you know, mm. to deal with, but his pain. He had yeah. to learn how to walk again and, you know, he broke so many bones in his body. Mm. And just mentally he's just is not good um but you know a tragedy like this is is hard and it's all because of complacency yeah you know being complacent having that she'll be right moment that's preventable that's that's the most 100%. sickening thing about it is that they're, they're not accidents they're not. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I was i was in uh emergency services and um a couple of organizations volunteer organizations when i was younger in my teenage years actually ses one of them and there's a lot of, even back then when I was 19, <laughs> which is a long time ago, uh, there was a focus on safety and there was this um, talk about accidents and that there's no such thing as an accident. There isn't. Um, they're, they're poor decisions that lead to poor era. outcomes. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we have so many safety protocols in place to keep us safe, mm. um, but we always find a, a shortcut. Mm -hmm. And I always say it's never an accident. It's always an incident waiting to happen because of complacent decisions that are made that lead up to it. That's right. And and that's what it is. We are all complacent. We're human. The human race is complacent. Mm. Full stop. Not just at work, at home, in the car, wherever we are, we have a complacent moment daily. Mm. It's mm. just a matter of recognising when we're being complacent to mm. actually stop and evaluate what we're doing because the minute she'll be right comes through our mind, it's not right. Mm. It's definitely not right. As challenging as that is to sit with and, and listen to and understand um, 
<clears throat> some of what you've been through, Patricia. I think it is the most crucial moment for brutal honesty to make people stop and think. Yeah. Um, we are so complacent. We don't think about how our actions could lead right. to a different outcome. We are so, I don't know, busy being human. Bravado, yes, <laughs> and very much human that we don't think about the possible outcomes and I think it's important that we sit with the rawness of what you've just explained and understand, and I would encourage every listener to put themselves in your shoes just for a moment and try and understand what that must feel like for you to learn that information and what can they then do every day to ensure safety for not only themselves but others because this isn't necessarily about our own personal safety. This is about what being complacent can mean for others, other families, other people, um, the rest. Everyone around you. That's mm. right. You know, for me, this is this the my safety presentations that I do on sites with toolbox talks pre-starts, um, wherever it is, and I travel all around Australia. I've been international to do these. Um, it's raw. Mm. Uh, I do show a video of um, the incident, and it's a four-minute video, and it is quite hard to watch, but that's the reality of what the incident mm. is. And so I take workers on a journey with me from the moment that I got that phone call of, you know, letting me know that something's happened and I've gone to the site. You know, once I've, re- I've, I've arrived there, I still did not know that Christopher had passed away. Oh, no. But here I am, mind you, I know every single person there because mm. I'm a coffee lady. I'm mum on that site. Yeah. You know, I, I bring everyone's lunches and their coffees every single day. So the whole situation is very personal when I get there. And and then they take me obviously into the first aid room to let me know that my son's passed away. And I, I'm still today have not accepted and mm. will never accept what happened mm. because yep. it was totally avoidable. And, and making workers understand that we all have a reason why we go to work. Yeah. And that reason is to build a better life for ourselves Mm. and to make sure that we get home safe to our families. Mm. We got we go there to to have, you know, to make money, bring it home and live our lives. Mm. But why are we risking our lives just to get that job done? Mm. What for? What's the point? Just stay home. You know, we have those reasons and we need to, I I hope that when I do my talks that, you know, not only am I speaking as a safety professional but as a mum, as to say, why are you doing that? Think about your life, think about the lives you leave behind or even if you get injured for that matter, it's the same thing. You know, injuries are just as bad, Yep, just as bad because you take that home with you. Patricia, did um, the learning about what happened with your son, understanding all of the true details about how that came about and then going through the court case, et cetera, did that bring you any kind of comfort? Um, no, I don't think it will ever bring comfort. It will never bring comfort because you know what it is? My fight is is just strong. It's, it, it, it needs to stay strong. And I know I will never accept what happened. So for me, yes, finding out is what I need to do. Mm-hmm. I need to find out. Is that background noise? No, no it's all you're good. all good. I, I have to, I've got to continue fighting because what happened to Christopher shall never happen again. Mm. And no Aussie should ever go to work and die. No, oh, I agree. And I just think that, you know, why is it happening? Why is it happening so often? Mm. When we do the statistics, every second day someone in Australia is going to work and dying. It's horrific. It is. horrific. The thing that that grates me even more about, about these situations is so often it's not the – the person who loses their life or is injured, it wasn't their decision that led to that in mm. the first place. You know, if, if uh, I mean, I've got a bit of bark off my head at the moment because I crashed my mountain bike. 
But that was my choice. That was my decision. I was, you know, I was riding the bike. I chose to go over that jump. And and so I can actually take responsibility for those consequences. But when when so many people step onto a work site mm. and somebody else has made a decision that puts, you know, my Maybe. life in danger or my personal safety in danger, I have no opportunity for ownership or responsibility. Right. Um, and, and it's how done do you often without that? my knowledge. How mm. do you accept that? Mm. Exactly. You know, I know Khaled, he wishes he died with Christopher. Oh, that's horrible. Because he, the pain he goes through and the mental, you know, demons that he has in his mm. head, he d- he prefers not to be here, mm. you know. And, and this is what people don't understand. We all go to work thinking, oh, yeah, we'll just get the job done. Mm. If I get injured, workers' comp will fix it. Yeah. Uh-uh, you get injured, it's life. Mm. Okay, especially on a job site. This is a life injury. Even if you break an ankle, that's a life injury. That's not mm. just, yeah, she'll be right. Oh, you yeah. may you may fix it. You may eight weeks you'll be able to walk back mm. on it, but the pain will be there forever. Mm. Yep. It Absolutely. won't go away. And when someone dies, that's it. Mm. It's over. You know, you can't change that. No. And that's that is the hardest thing. That I try to make people understand. Don't take life for granted. Don't go to work and risk your life because it's just not worth it. It isn't. It isn't. I'd like to talk about the impact um, that this has, or the known impact that you understand, Patricia, on everybody else around you. So it's not just you, it's your family, it's the siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. And then when you bring it back to that job site and you think about all the people that were there on the day and the emergency services and then the people responsible for what's happened and the far-reaching impact of what happened on that day, I wonder if you can give us a bit of a sense of your understanding of what that has meant for all of those people. Yes, well, it is huge. Um, It is actually unmeasurable. Um, There was 250 workers on that site. Wow. Wow. Two bricklayers were actually on the scaffold when it collapsed from underneath them. Oh, goodness. So they'd just come off a lunch and they were standing on the scaffold and realised that the scaffold moved away from the building and that's when they jumped and they actually jumped onto the ledge of this balcony and it was 25 or 26-year-old and a 65-year-old. Oh, Obviously the 65-year-old isn't as agile as a 26-year-old. He didn't quite make it, so he's actually hanging off the side of the ledge while this scaffold has just come down from underneath them and a 26-year-old has pulled him up. These are bricklayers. They need to use scaffold every single day of their lives. Mm. Their lives is not the same. No. Mm. Many, many workers actually quit their job mm. that day not to ever return. Yeah. Um, being mum on that site, made it so much harder for every single worker to to mm. actually get over what actually happened. Absolutely. Everybody loved Christopher. They, they, you know, I'd have other trades come to me and always say, Trish, if Christopher ever wants to change his job and, <laughs> and, and become a plumber or an electrician, please let me know. I'll take him on. This is the mm. type of kid Christopher was. Yeah. So not only has he affected my me my husband and my kids but his whole family every friend that he had and beyond that because when I speak to people and they recognize me they'll say you're Christopher's mum and they always say I still remember what I was doing when you're when the when it hit the news I remember what I was doing who 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 says that Mm -hmm. Christopher was an 18 year old you know, he died. He died like a celebrity. Mm. You know, you only know when a celebrity dies and it remembers and it sticks to your mind. Christopher had that same effect to every single person I speak to, mm. and not only you know in New South Wales, mm. everywhere. Mm. Everybody knows when I say Christopher, they know who I am and who Christopher is. So the impact has been huge, and this is why I do what I do. Mm. I hope that his name will always be remembered in the name of safety and that everybody stops and thinks about their own lives. 
Can we talk about uh, the culture? So I'm a builder's wife and <clears throat> I've seen safety has been a battle for a, a long time and through complacency and I've had many incidents that don't bear mentioning after what Christopher went through. Um, and they came about through almost an arrogance from some people that came on site around not only their own safety but the safety of others. And then the other thing I really saw was this culture of people being put down, bullied, spoken illy of because they dared to put their hand up and say something was wrong. I think there's still a real cultural shift that needs to happen around yeah. safety in the construction industry. I think in all levels, and I see it particularly in on commercial sites, um, there seems to be a real culture shift needed in that space. Yes. I'd like to understand if if I'm, I don't believe that I am, but is that something that you're seeing really frequently as well, something that you, you hear in the feedback that you get? I see it on my own site. Yeah. I see it in my own home. I'm doing renovations at the moment. And there is tradies that come here and I, they'll do something and I'll be like, oh, what are you doing? It's like, well, how else am I going to do this? Mm. Like, what do you mean? Because there has got to be a safer way of doing this. You know, you, you've got to realise that you're, you're actually risking your life in what you're about to do. Mm. Um, and it's not going to happen on my house. No. Yeah. It's, you know, and the, the, the thing is, is well, how else am I going to do it? Yeah. It's a no, late- no regard on their own safety. No. It, that's not an excuse. No. There is always a way. There's always a way of being safer. Mm. And, you know, unfortunately everybody's too scared to put their hand up and say, stop. Mm. Don't do that. That's wrong. Because they, they they fear they're going to get their heads knocked in mm-hmm. by someone, or they're going to get victimized, mm-hmm. bullied, or worse, lose their jobs. Mm. And there's many people out there that can't lose their jobs. Yeah, mm. and so they think, well, I'm not going to say anything. And this is the reason why one of the first things I did with government is to implement the Speak Up app, mm-hmm. which is the Speak Up with Safe Work New South Wales. Mm-hmm where workers are able to anonymously speak up with an app, take photos and upload it directly to SafeWork, and then SafeWork triages it and then goes to the site and inspects it. Mm -hmm. Great idea. When the first statistics came out, I nearly fell off the chair. Mm -hmm. I went, what? Like there was 2,937 submissions made within six months. Wow. Last year it reached 10,000. Now, how on earth is SafeWork supposed to get to all of them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is why I always encourage workers to speak up. Speak up within. Go to your managers. You have every single right to speak up and say no to an unsafe work practice. Mm. You, it is now law. Category 1 law in WHS has now been changed because I've pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. It has now got gross negligent and reckless behaviour even if an incident has not occurred and you take on an unsafe work practice, you are liable for a Category 1 offence and you can get prosecuted even as a worker, not just a PCBU, as a worker. Mm. And that's a Category 1 offence. Obviously, industrial manslaughter is what I'm pushing for next. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are a Labor government now and hopefully these changes will be made Mm -hmm. um, sooner rather than later. But putting on those, you know, if we compare ourselves to the other states which have industrial manslaughter already in place, except for us in Tasmania, there is reins there. Mm. And people go, whoa, stop, what are you doing? I can go to jail for this. Mm. Whether in New South Wales we don't have that. You know, our the 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 highest fine is $3.5 million. That is it. It's nothing. Which, no. Which for most there is no deterrent. Yeah, I mean, most of the companies will just declare bankruptcy. They can't pay it anyway and go keep doing what they're doing. Nothing changes. Yeah. So it's hard to get it. The best thing that's been come out is obviously David Chandler. We have the, our building commissioner now um, that goes out there and oversees these issues. Mm. You know, the I certification of builders to make sure that they are certified. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of changes that are coming. 
And I'm glad these changes are being made. It, it's taking a long time, but slowly but surely we we need these massive changes and give give workers the courage to say no. Mm. Yeah, it seems because they have uh, every right. They do. It, it seems uh, we we literally interviewed somebody recently around HR stuff and some of the federal laws that are being brought into place around, you know pay equality and these sorts of things. And then I hear stories like yours and Christopher's and am reminded of the of the insane practices that are happening on not just construction work sites, you know, it's in, happening in factories Everywhere. and retail. It's it's, you know, all work sites. And it just seems to be left for the states to deal with as per normal. And even then it's it's sort of it's it's like the poor cousin to all of the big headline yeah vote grabbing issues um have you have you struggled with mm. getting uh, an audience patricia like have you found it challenging to get politicians and lawmakers to take this stuff seriously it's, look they know i'm here they know <laughs> i I'm bet they do <laughs> i can tell you now safe work and government do know that i exist and that i won't be going far mm. and i will be keeping keeping on the fight to make sure these changes are made. Common sense. I just want common sense. Mm. Unfortunately, there is no common sense in our law. Um, mm. No one is culpable for when someone dies. Mm. So in Christopher's case, no one goes to jail, even though it's it was proven on who actually made that decision. They, they don't pay for it. It goes to the company. The company just pays the fine. And in most cases, the insurance company pays mm. for that fine which is another change that I made, is that no insurance shall ever pay any WHS penalties. Mm. So that's been taken off. So it's, it is a personal liability. Is that the um, case in the other states, Patricia? No. It's in New South Wales. A lot of the other states are looking into it because obviously a lot of insurance companies prick their ears and went, well, we mm. want that too. You know what that's I mean? Right. Why should we pay for somebody, somebody's negligence? Mm. That's right. You know, it, it it doesn't happen in a car. No. You're behind the wheel and you kill someone, it's manslaughter. That's right. Regardless if you're drunk or not. Yep. Mm. You you killed someone. Mm. It is instant manslaughter. And you'll pay for it. Whether in at work you kill a worker in New South Wales, nothing. There's nothing. The total fines. Um, on Christopher's case, totaled to two point nine million dollars, nine hundred for the nine hundred thousand for the builder, two million dollars for the synergy, the scaffolding company, which goes directly to SafeWork New South Wales. And then I then have to do a civil case where I have to prove my pain and suffering. How ridiculous! Any compensation whatsoever. It's like we're in the bloody medieval times where. Mm -hmm. You know the the landlords and the and the wealthy just owned everybody, and yeah. lives weren't worth any more than the work they could do. It's crazy. It is. You know, I I wanted government to listen to. I said I don't want to change these laws because I want people to go to jail. Mm -hmm. mm. I want these laws to be put in as a deterrent mm. for people to stop mm. doing the wrong thing. Um, when people have listened to my talk it kind of shifts them because i do bring that reality of what a tragedy looks like yeah and it shifts them to make them think as to yeah why am i doing that why am i risking my life to get this job done mm. and i because i take them on this journey they think about their own mom they think about their own wife or husband or children at home and that's what i want them to go home with after I finished with them, it's take usually I speak for about an hour to an hour and, and ten. After I finished, no one moves. Mm -hmm. No one gets off their chair. It's just like it, it's everything is just quiet for the whole duration. That people are so like gobsmacked to think that a simple decision can be so detrimental. Mm. We all we are all responsible for safety. Patricia, is anybody Sorry, has anybody from either of the companies, the builder or the scaffolding company, ever reached out to you? At the beginning, yes. Mm. They both came to my house and, you know, 
gave out their condolences. But it, it was hard. It was, I don't know, it's, it, it is hard, especially for Synergy, because I knew every single one of them. Mm. You know what I mean? And I still feel for them. Mm. As much as I, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I still cry for them. Of course. Because they have to live with this. You know, these are normal human beings. I'm not seeing them as a company. These are human beings that go to bed at night and say, what if mm. I should have, I could have, and, you know, have to live with Christopher's death because of a simple decision that could have stopped it from happening. Mm. And I don't want other workers to have to go through this. Mm. You know, no one should ever walk past an unsafe situation and say it's not my job. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, and yet it still happens. I don't understand. But And uh, as a parent, I think mum or dad, any parent, you, you look at these situations, you think about your children or you think about the impact on your children if it was you. Sometimes yeah. that can change your thinking, and yet I still see that complacency, which is so frustrating. I'm really hoping that the rawness of your story stops people in their tracks and, you know, they take the time to think. Yeah. I guess... For me then, as a mum, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know how on earth you made the transition through grief to speak so openly about the journey that you've been on and to help create this awareness and make the changes that you are contributing to making. Can you share with us how that journey has evolved for you and, and at what point did you make the decision that you were even able to do this? Um, I never put my hand up for it. Mm. It just happened. I my first speaking engagement was May 1st which was exactly a, a month after Christopher died. Wow. And that was at May Day March with the unions. I went out um they I led the the union march and I went on stage and there was over 10,000 workers in mm. Hyde Park. That was my first speaking engagement ever. Wow. Um, you know, and I never really put my hand up for it. I'm just, I think it's my anger drives what I do. I am so angry at mm. what happened. And I know I'm never, ever going to get over this. And so I have to turn it into something positive because it will eat me up alive. Mm. And I do, I do have two beautiful boys that I have to look after. Yeah. Mm as well and I have my husband you know I live for them mm. I live for them and mm. if I can't make those changes knowing that even my son is a tradie and protect him in his life yeah to so people can understand that we're all precious mm. every single one of us is precious and we we should be going to work to earn that money so we can have that that life we all want mm. not that we're risking it just to get it and we can go home to our families because when you don't go home, everything changes. How is your family? How, how are your boys? How's your husband? How is everyone coping? It's a struggle. Yeah. It's a struggle. This is the reason why I'm renovating the house. It's very hard to be at home. Yeah. I've, um, I've rearranged the whole house, mm -hmm. like completely gutted the whole house changed the entry, um, extended to put our, our living area in a totally different area mm -hmm. because since Christopher died, it's now been four years, we have still not eaten on our dinner table because no. it's just too hard. And so we've I've made that extension. I've put our living area there to hopefully bring a new beginning and a new life into this home, which, you know, people say, why don't you sell? I said, no, because I don't. Christopher was still here, mm -hmm. still part of, you know, this house. But it's just being here, things still in their places of where they are, it's just too hard mm -hmm. to wait. And we still have to go through our civil case. So we haven't even touched the sides yet of our mental health. Um, and I worry about that. I worry about my kids having to have to go through the court cases and being prodded and, you know, Having to have to prove their pain and suffering. It's ridiculous. Is there any compensation? I feel outraged for you. I, I actually feel incredibly angry for you. But this is the reason why I'm on this mission. 
mm. because I know there will never be any justice for my son through the judicial system. No. And the only justice I can get is through my work of what I do. Patricia, you've talked a bit about government and obviously, you know, that has to be a huge part of, of um, driving change with legislation and punitive measures. Has there been any other positive response from industry or other industry groups that have yes. that have sort of gotten behind this and trying to drive change with you? Yes. Well, I um, sometimes some of the bigger companies have got me out to do toolbox talks and, and doing a safety presentation, not knowing exactly what they're going to get. Um, uh, it's it blows it blows them away in the sense that you know you got project managers and safety managers standing there and looking out to 150 200 workers sitting there in total silence listening to every single word I say that they've never seen that before mm-hmm. and so they're kind of taken back when I finish and go, oh, my God, that was the most powerful thing that I've ever seen. Mm. But what keeps me going is the response I get from the workers after Mm. they leave the room is they personally text me to say I've never experienced anything like that and I've now now, now changed the way I do things in my life because I've just realised my own complacency in what I do in my life that could lead to such tragedies Mm. and I could not think of anything worse in leaving behind my family Mm. for a job. Yeah, it's it's almost uh, sometimes it's harder to drive change from the top down with legislators and everything and, and in fact, if we get the people on board, Mm. uh, then there's no choice for governments. Uh, They have to. Everyone has to to say no. Just say Mm. no. Simple. That's right. You can't, without the worker, and I say this to the workers all the time, there is a lot of importance in different tiers in your workplace, okay? You've got your managers, you've got your safety managers, you've got your workers, you've got other people in the site. Who are the most important people in that site? It's the workers. Mm. Without the workers, the work does not get done. Mm. Simple. And I tell them, doesn't matter what you do, if you don't get the job done today, it will still be here tomorrow. It will still be here next week and next year. And if you die, the job will still get done. Mm. You are replaceable. Mm. But guess what? You're not replaceable to your family. No. When you're gone, you're gone. Mm. And this is what I'm trying to make people understand, that it's just not worth it, really isn't. It's not worth the pain, even for companies. Be proactive. You know, if you own a company, if you own a business, be proactive when it comes to safety. Don't just say, oh, I've got safety protocols in place. Act upon it. Mm. Because I can tell you now being proactive is way cheaper than being reactive. Yeah. Mm. Reactive can cost you your whole business and cost you your own mental health. Mm. No one would want to be um, in, a, in a position where they've had a death on their own watch. No. Because mm. it stays with you forever. Absolutely. And I always say this to the workers. Unless, I mean, the reason why I show a video and the reason why I'm so, why I don't sugarcoat my presentation is because that's the closest that I can get the worker to be in front of a tragedy and what a tragedy actually looks like. Yeah. Because unless they've been there, safety will never be in the forefront of their mind. That's, That's right. just a fact. And that is why it is hard to watch, but it is real. Mm. Absolutely. Patricia, um, I feel like you have a lot of fight in you, so this is going to go for a long time. Apart from the the civil case, obviously, um, what else what else is in the future for you and your foundation, and and what sort of goals, I guess, do you have? Well, the Touch by Christopher Foundation. So let's talk about safety. Is what I do with my safety presentations, and then Touch by Christopher is the charity. So 
I raise money to help families who have lost a loved one in the workplace in New South Wales. Mm-hmm. Um, this My goals, obviously, is to go national, mm-hmm. um, to cover all deaths in Australia. But unfortunately, we have so many deaths that, you know, it will be very hard to, to be able to facilitate that. So it's now condensed in New South Wales. And what we do is when someone dies at work, we try to contact the family or get the family to contact us, which is a little bit hard at the moment because obviously privacy laws, I can't go to Safework and say, I need the name of who died. Mm. Um, so it's a matter of awareness, getting that awareness on Touch by Christopher that we are here. We provide three months' worth of groceries to the family based on however many people are in the household. And it's it's worked out at $20 per person per day for 92 days. So if there's four people, um, it's, you know, $80 per day for 92 days. Plus we pay $1,500 towards any bills that they may have outstanding, like water bills, you know, gas, whatever it is. Um, and my, my short-term goal is to reach my next goal of having – um, raising funds so that I can also add three months worth of mortgage or rent mm-hmm. on top of that as well. Because the majority of the time when someone dies, it's actually the breadwinner. Yeah. Yeah. And bills don't stop. No. They just keep coming. And Touch by Christopher is there to just help families with that everyday burden so mm-hmm. that they can grieve. Because compensation does not come straight away either. No. no. Such a time-consuming process if it, it happens at all. Yeah. You know, and I, it's sad. It is so, so sad. People can lose their homes because mm. the income has stopped mm. and there's just no buffer. There's nothing. Mm. You know, and I, and I, it, it is very sad. We were very lucky. Um, you know, Christ, we weren't dependent on Christopher. Um, but we had a lot of help from people, and that's why I started Touch by Christopher because I want to give back. Mm. Um, I do have a barbecue charity barbecue on the 21st of May at Macquarie Park, which um, I'm hoping for people to either come sponsor it and be part of it. Uh, it's it'll be just a family day, it's from 10, 10 to 3, and it'll be on the 21st of May this year. And it's at it's at Lachlan's line where Christopher's memorial is, where the actual incident happened. Mm. So, um, you know, that's ho- hopefully we can raise enough money to be able to get that goal, mm. to be able to include the mortgage and rent for people as well. And that well, that is my goals at the moment, you know. And obviously, my biggest mission is to get in front of every single worker mm. to deliver my message and hopefully shift their complacent mindsets. Mm. and give them the courage to speak up. Patricia, how do people find you and find out more about the Touched by Christopher Foundation? Uh, We have the website is Mm touchedbychristopher.org.au and um, they can donate online as well. Uh, There's the events are on there usually and my other website is the let's talk about safety.com.au which is our the speaking engagement so if anyone wants me to come onto their site to speak to their workers about complacency and speaking up they can just contact me or they can call me on my on my phone as well yeah. give me a call i uh would really like to come give you a great big hug and i don't know how to say sorry i don't think there's a right way to say how sorry I am that this happened to you and your boy. I thank you for sharing so honestly with us. Thank you. So that others have the having. opportunity to mm. hear um, what they can do to prevent something like this happening. Yeah. yeah. We all need to band together. And yep. this is why I encourage workers to speak up. Just say no. Mm. It is your life. Everybody has a part to play, and I think it's too easy to make this the government's responsibility or the primary contractor's responsibility or the safety app's responsibility. We're all responsible. <clears throat> we are and all responsible. 100%. Every single we all one have of us. A part to play. Even if yeah. you're walking past something that's got nothing to do with you, it's, it's a possibility to go and poke your nose in and take a risk um, because it might save the life of someone like, like your boy. Yes. 
Yeah. Patricia, thank you. Um, no, thank you. We really appreciate your time. Uh, listeners, please do go and, uh, if you if you can, go and donate uh, if you're in the Sydney area. Um, <clears throat> obviously, get down to the charity barbecue, yeah. um, but go and check out those websites. We'll put all the details in the description for this episode and our show notes. And uh, Patricia, wishing you all the very best um, with your your quest. And uh, yeah, we uh, Thank you. express our our uh, condolences and um i think it's amazing what you're doing and how you're honoring your son's life so thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast and and spread the message it's um you know very nice of you to have me on here so absolute pleasure thank you thank you